Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about everything and anything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, intuitive counselor, and above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on the quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What is life all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. I hope you enjoyed my nine bonus episodes I have released over the past two months. We are now back with just a few delays to our regular schedule of the main episodes released every second Wednesday. I might be releasing more bonus episodes, perhaps as experimentals on different topics, shorts and my promos. There is in fact a bonus episode coming up, which is a promo of my new meditation album just released. It will have all the information about it and few audio highlights, so I'd like to make just a brief announcement about it on this podcast. The album is called Inspirational Meditations for Each Day of the Week, and that's exactly what it is. Seven superbly relaxing guided meditations on a soft musical background, one for each day of the week, Monday to Sunday. They are not just relaxing, but also inspirational. Each meditation is focused on the corresponding chakra, from the root chakra on Monday to the crown chakra on Sunday, exploring how these energy centers affect certain elements of our personality and behavior balancing our reflection in the world as a human being and a soul. You will find this album in the store on my main website at quantumliving.com.au. It's a perfect gift for a loved one on Valentine's Day. And now back to today's episode. There are some topics we explore on the show sitting right at the intersection of science and spirituality, which are like the tip of an iceberg holding so much more than we can see. They are like quicksilver, moving all over the place, unable to be contained. Remote viewing is one of such topics. When you ask someone what is remote viewing, you won't get just one straight answer, as one explanation leads to another, then another, and another. It is about psychic phenomena, clairvoyance, the sixth sense, the loss of quantum physics, the non-local nature of consciousness, the universe, the human potential. It is about meditation, altered states of consciousness, reincarnation and the afterlife, the higher self, the soul and the concept of God. It addresses the geopolitical spectrum, our history, time travel, past, present and future as we know them. I could go on and on. (laughs) And that's what I love about such topics. You cannot isolate them from the quantum field or from the narrative of the spiritual evolution of the humankind. Everything is connected. I've been wanting to have an episode on remote viewing on my podcast for a long time. There are many experts and practitioners of remote viewing out there, usually with their own views and protocols. So I have decided to invite a top expert in this field to explore and unpack the secrets of remote viewing, yes, there is more than one, (laughs) for us on this show. I'm sure that many of you won't be surprised. 
My special guest today is Stefan A. Schwartz, a scientist, futurist, award-winning author of both fiction and non-fiction, a distinguished associate scholar of the California Institute for Human Science, who holds numerous prestigious honors, titles, and awards for his outstanding contribution in this field. An experimentalist, Stefan has been studying the nature of consciousness for over 40 years. His work has been recognized and covered by numerous magazines, newspapers, and television productions across the world. He's done hundreds of radio and podcast interviews, and so I'm thrilled to welcome him on my show, as he now joins me from an undisclosed location. Hello, Stefan. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's an honor and pleasure to have you on my show. My pleasure to be with you. I'm happy to do it. Beautiful. I appreciate that you have done so many interviews on the subject of remote viewing, covering its aspects from every possible angle. Still, I hope that uh, we can take this conversation through the roads less traveled, so to speak and find some fresh ideas for our audience. To set the scene, could you please tell us how you became interested in the study of consciousness and specifically remote viewing? Well, I woke up when I was 23 years old. I had a series of odd experiences, and I was introduced to the Edgar Casey material, and I spent about five years reading every Edgar Cayce reading from the first to the last. As far as I know, I'm the only person other than Gladys Davis, his archivist, who ever did that. And in 1968, because the Cayce readings kept saying other people could do this, I thought, well, let me see. I'll see if that's true. So I decided to set up an experiment and uh, put a, I built a grid out of some rope staked it out in my back garden, had originally 12 squares, eventually got up to 144, and I would bury mason jars or 35 millimeter film canisters with objects in them in one of the grids, and I would make a mimeograph of a picture of the grid and send it out to people all over the world and ask them first to see if they could locate in which of the grids it was buried, and then to describe it for me. And I found out people could do that, and with remarkable accuracy. In those days, I called it distant viewing. I didn't, there wasn't anybody else doing it. I didn't, uh, I didn't really know anybody in the uh, research community at that point. <clears throat> but in any case, because I came out of an anthropological background, and was familiar with that literature, I knew that, it, that um, in archaeology, the big question at the time, this is back in the late 60s, was where to look, because most archaeological finds were made serendipitously. Some farmer was plowing his field and turned up a temple, or a road crew was building a new highway and found a tomb, or whatever. So the big big thing was that most of these things were just found sort of by luck. And I thought, well, that's perfect from my point of view, because it permits me to design an experiment that is triple blind. That is, at the time that I obtained the information, no one in the world knew what that information was. They didn't know where the location of the thing was, nor did they know what would be found if you dug there. So from my frame of reference, that was perfect because one of my questions was, is this ability to do this electromagnetic in nature and is it physiologically based in the brain? And if you could describe something, the location of something that nobody knew existed, and if you could not only locate it, uh, and t but tell me, exactly what I would find when I got there, and no one in the world knew that, and it wasn't recorded in any document, then it necessarily meant that that aspect of consciousness was not physiologically based. 
It wasn't built in the brain. It had to be acquired uh, in some other way. Uh, and so the, uh, the question I had also, as I said, was, is this electromagnetic in nature? And at that time, I couldn't answer that question. This is in the, again in the late 60s. But I began doing this grid. And as I say, I started with 12 grids. And, and a friend of mine who was a statistician said, well, it would be more impressive if there were more, of the, more squares in the grid. So I, then I made it up to 144 so that statistically, uh, although I wasn't particularly interested in the statistics, I knew other people were. Because to me, if you were in Australia and I could send you a little picture of this grid, a mimeograph picture for people that are old enough to know what mimeograph was, and you could locate the thing and then you could describe it for me from thousands of miles away, statistics, while interesting in science, really were completely overtaken by the fact that, that someone could do that because they had to have access to information that uh, other people didn't know. Uh, in these experiments, uh, these early ones with the grid, I mean, I knew where the thing was buried, but in, in an, to do an archaeological find, that meant that nobody knew. So I immediately began organizing to do an archaeological project. And about that time, this is now the early 70s, I had gone to Washington, D.C., and I had been asked to become the special assistant to the chief of naval operations. And I was, uh, at that time, the, the American Navy was very interested in how do you communicate with a deep ocean submarine without having it come up to the surface, because if it came anywhere near the surface, then the Soviet satellites could pick up the heat from the uh, nuclear reactor that powered the submarine. So they wanted them to say very deeply underwater. And the problem is, is that seawater shields from electromagnetic radiation. In fact, it does it so well that the, there's only one part of the electromagnetic spectrum that would work, something called ELF, extreme low frequency. 3 to 300 hertz. And the Navy had spent about $125 million answering the question of how deep do you have to go? And, equally important, how much information can you transmit? And if you've seen a movie, for instance, The Search for Red October, you know there's a scene in the movie where they get this little signal while they're submerged in the submarine, and it's just like one, two, three. Because the problem with ELF is you can get only a very tiny amount of information can be transmitted because of the nature of the waveform. So if someone could locate a ship on the seafloor and describe it for me, they had that, that was going into the water, then that required that they would give me much more information than could possibly be obtained from ELF. And uh, at about that time, while I was, while the Navy was doing this research, a friend of mine who was the head of the CIA began to send me these translations of these documents from a Russian scientist, Soviet scientist, uh, named Leonid Vasiliev. And he had been asked by the Central Committee of the Politburo to uh, answer that same question. What could you do with electromagnetics? It wasn't electromagnetic. And he had put people down into caves and down into mines. And he put them in Faraday cages down in the mines. And he discovered that he eliminated every part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And it didn't make any difference in their performance. They did just as well as they did when they were on the surface. But he said the only thing he couldn't shield for was ELF. And he went to Admiral Gorshkov, and he writes about this in these, these papers that I, they were being sent to me. And he went to Admiral Gorshkov, who was then the head of the Soviet Navy, and he asked him if he could do this submarine experiment. And for whatever reason, they wouldn't do it. They were never able to do it. So I realized, okay, well, that was the way. So I went to uh, Admiral Hyman Rickover, who was then the the founder of the American Nuclear Navy, and um, 
really the, the head of deep ocean submarines. And I asked him if I could put somebody aboard a, a submarine when it was doing one of its sea trials and uh, if I could get them to do what I called in those days distant viewing. is a terrible term because I later learned it has nothing to do with space, nor does it have anything to do with time. And he thought about it. He said, let me think about it. And after a while, he called me up about a week later and he said, I, you know, I don't want to do that. It's an interesting experiment, but it will get a lot of media. To, it'll leak out. It'll get a lot of media attention on the submarines, and we're, we don't want that. So I know I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it. And so I thought, well, it'll probably never happen again because, I mean, where do you get a submarine, right? But uh, in 1976, I was uh, offered a fellowship at the Philosophical Research to become their senior fellow. And I went out and I stayed with a friend of mine uh, who had just retired from the Navy, a man named Donald Keach, who'd been deputy director of Navy Labs. And he said, you know that crazy experiment you wanted to do? And I said, oh, sure. He said, well, we have a submarine that's coming down to do its sea trials at our uh, Catalina Island facility. And uh, we'll pay for three days of you doing that experiment. Because my experiment was, first of all, could people look from wherever they were in the world, could they look to the bottom of the sea and describe a previously unknown wreck on the sea floor? And then could I put somebody in a submarine at depth and get them to describe <laughs> where other people were hiding in the United States, somewhere in the United States? So I'm looking into the water, and then I'm at the in underneath the water, looking out. And if if those two things could be done, then it would shield from the ELF electromagnetic radiation because I knew exactly how much data you could transmit, and I also knew how deep you had to get because the Navy had spent all this money working that out. And they said, "Well, we'll we'll pay for three days of the experiment." And so that became what is known as Project Deep Quest. And I actually filmed it. You can go to my personal website, stephanaschwartz.com, and you can see mm. the movie. I got Leonard Nimoy, who was Dr. Spock from the Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek. Oh, yeah. Uh, I met Leonard and I asked him if he would narrate the film when for was me, that? which he did. This is 1977. Okay. So I, we worked it out in 76, in the, in the spring of 76. And and um, I came out in 77 to do it when the submarine came down, and I took it, I agreed to take the fellowship. So there we were, and um, I sent out a map of the, of the ocean, a sea chart, and I said to people, please locate for me a uh, unknown sea wreck on the bottom of the, of the sea floor. And they located several places. But uh, uh, I had all of them picked a particular place. We call those consensus zones, where more than one person picks the same site. So that was the site I went to, or, or, or decided to search. And um, I asked the, uh, the uh, crew of the submarine Taurus, a research submarine, and I asked them... Uh, you know, they had been there about three months at that point, And they said, oh, we've searched all over the ocean on the seafloor from the submarine. And there's nothing there. I'm sorry, that, that site doesn't exist. And I said, well, let's go see. And so I had a, a surface ship and I got them to drop what's called a pinger. It goes ping, ping, ping. So you could home in on it. You would only go to the exactly to the place that the remote viewers had described. And uh, we did that. And lo and behold, there it was. Mm. So that was a really very significant validation of your 
theory. And as they say, the rest is history because you just went on pursuing this research. Wonderful story. So, Stefan, what is remote viewing? Is it a psychic phenomenon, namely clairvoyance, or more than that? And if so, what's the difference? Well, all those words are old-fashioned. Nobody uses them anymore. Mm -hmm. um, remote viewing is accessing non-locally sourced information. And in order to understand it, you have to really understand what we what space-time reality is. In uh, 1931, Max Planck, the father of quantum mechanics, was interviewed by the Observer newspaper in London, and that was a big deal because Planck didn't give a lot of interviews. And the reporter said to him, my editor sent me here to, to because you and Einstein are the most famous scientists in the world. And you've been doing all this research, and you're the father of quantum mechanics. What have you learned? And Planck's answer, he said, what I have learned, I, I mean, I don't think this is at all what the reporter thought he was going to hear. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Planck said, what I have learned is that consciousness is causal and fundamental. Space-time arises from consciousness, not consciousness from space-time. That is, consciousness exists independent of physical reality and that it is not entirely sourced in the brain. He said you can't get behind consciousness. It is the fundamental. When you begin to think in that way, you understand that what we call reality, space-time, is the an information architecture created by intentioned consciousness, not just human consciousness, not even necessarily planetary consciousness. So the two great mystery questions, and I don't know the answer to either one, so I'm sorry, is what is consciousness? And the other mystery question is what is information? Because when you begin to do research in consciousness, whether it's near-death experiences, or reincarnation, or remote viewing, or what you encounter is that there is an aspect of consciousness that exists independent of the brain, that existed before you incarnated, and that will continue after you have physically died. It is what religion calls the soul. I would call it the eternal self. And apparently, based on the reincarnation research, episodically this internal self uh, manifests another personality, uh, incarnates it, and that continues for that person's life. And then after they die, it, it, uh, it becomes part of the information architecture of the eternal self. And so the key to the whole business to obtain non-locally sourced information is the ability to attain and sustain intentioned, focused awareness. For instance, meditators routinely do better than non-meditators. Why? Are they smarter? Not necessarily. What we have learned is that the ability to access this non-locally sourced information as I say, is a function of being able to attain and sustain intentioned focused awareness. That's why they that's why they teach meditation in martial art dojos or Tibetan lamasaries or Buddhist monasteries or wherever throughout human history. And we know that as far back as Neanderthal, that the Neanderthals had a sense of non local consciousness and that it appears religion is essentially a manifestation of an interest in non-local consciousness. Absolutely. And I will uh, want to come back to the subject of meditation in, in a moment. But firstly, speaking of consciousness, as you said, we don't really know what it is. And I feel that it is partially or even mainly because we are an integral part of it observing it from within, if you like. And so it would be like asking a drop of water in the ocean, what is the phenomenon called the ocean? <laughs> it would probably say, well, it's me and everything else, 
because it is observing it from within. But we can describe it, I think, to an extent based on our individual experience. So my question to you is, how would you best describe what is consciousness? Well, I would say to you that consciousness is a sense of awareness that transcends space-time and that it, when you open to this part of yourself, what uh, mostly in the cultures is called the still small voice, you recognize that you are in a matrix of consciousness. That is, to use your analogy, you're a drop of water in an ocean and that all consciousness is interconnected and interdependent. And so we are in a state of consciousness of which our personality and our physical being is a manifestation of intentioned consciousness, but that we are part of the matrix. We don't have dominion over the matrix and that we are connect everything is connected because it is all part of a greater unity. Now, why that unity exists, I don't know. Who created it, I don't know. But it is apparent, it is based on the research. I'm an experimentalist. So everything I know, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a theologian. Everything I know is based on objectively verifiable information. That's what I care about. And you objectively verify what you're saying. And from the research, what we have learned is that, is this idea about consciousness, this idea about information, and also that we know that it is can be altered by intentioned consciousness. We know that, for instance, intentioned consciousness can allow you to change the molecular structure of water. It can cause you to change the physical well-being of other beings. We know that when a large number of people on the planet focus on a single thing, that it changes the nature of reality, and that what we call reality is alterable because of directed intentioned consci consciousness. Absolutely. Meditation is such an important topic, and it's very close to my heart because not only I practice meditation, but I actually teach theta meditation. And I've got a couple of questions specifically about meditation in the context of remote viewing. As you mentioned, an altered state of consciousness, such as in meditation, facilitates remote viewing. Now, in my view, and I'll be curious to, to hear your opinion on that, in my view, this is not just any meditation. As we know, there are various levels of meditation. There's mindfulness, then the light meditation in the alpha brainwave state, and then there is a theta meditation, which is a deep meditative state. And in this particular state, which is called transcendental or deep meditation, we lose the awareness of our physical body and experience our being as pure non-local consciousness. And I'm speaking from personal experience here. <laughs> Our ego dissolves. We feel we are one with the universe, with all that is. And it is also a state of hypnosis, trance, and healing. We are aligned with the frequency of the quantum field. And I believe that we can activate the pineal gland, which is said to be the portal to other dimensions. And so in this particular state, our psychic senses are wide open. So it makes perfect sense that at this frequency of our brain waves, we are able to facilitate and practice remote viewing. What is your view on, on the particular theta state of brain waves or frequency? And another quick question in terms of the various frequencies. There is also a very interesting brain wave called the gamma, which is a very high frequency between 40 and 100 hertz and above, I understand, which is linked to ecstasy, spiritual visions and bliss. So all this would indicate a, a, a perfect state of mind, if you like, wide open to subtle energy, subtle information, 
What is your take and your view on those two particular states of of mind, if you like, the theta and gamma state in the context of remote viewing? Well, first of all, this doesn't have anything to do with energy, which is <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing for me since I coined the term subtle energy, but it doesn't have anything to do with energy. And we don't have a very clear idea, really, about what part of the brain or what is operating. There is some research, Jean Ochterberg, for instance, did a series of experiments where she put people into MRIs while kahuna priests were focusing healing intention on them and discovered that the prefrontal cortex and the superior anterior temporal gyrus were activated. Um, a guy named Mark Jung Beeman put people into MRIs and asked them to solve problems that could not be solved intellectually and required a, a kind of insight, as he called it. And again, he also found this similar response. So it isn't altogether, we just don't know with any great certainty which part of the brain is activated when the non-local becomes local. I'm hoping this year to get the funding to do an experiment to answer that question. So I'll let you know if the experiment gets funded. But in terms of the frequency, does it make any difference? I, I, the, the frequency is same problem. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of stories out there. Uh, there are all kinds of people who make claims about certain things. But as I, again, I say I'm an experimentalist. And so when I look at the research data, and I'm pretty familiar with it, um, it is not clear what role frequency, and frequency is within space-time. You can only have frequency if you have space-time. So if you're outside of space-time, frequency is irrelevant. It, doesn't, it, may, it may have an informational enriching involvement, but if you don't have a brain, and yet you are still able to have experiences, and for instance, people who have near-death experiences, about 13 million people in the United States have done that, you're brain dead, and yet you're having consciousness. So frequency is not the issue. What we, the, the one thing that we can say with some certainty is that the ability to attain and sustain intention-focused awareness is the key. So you have to be able, you know, most of what we call thinking or most of what we are call awareness is we are responding to our sense impressions of our neuroanatomy. It's hot, it's cold, it's light, it's dark. There's a good smell, there's a bad smell. Uh, it's noisy, it's quiet, all that kind of stuff. That's all your neuroanatomy reporting to you what your senses are telling you. And that's most of what people, when they're thinking, that's what, that's what thinking is to most people. Or you are, you are just repeating in your own mind, oh, I should have asked her this last night. Um, I should have done that, that kind of thing. When you look at people who are particularly good at accessing non-local consciousness, and again, words like psychic, clairvoyant, those are all old-fashioned words that we, we don't really use in science anymore. We talk about non-local consciousness. And of course, the big question is, can we demonstrate unequivocally that it is not physiologically based? And, and the answer, I think, is starting with Deep Quest and my archaeological stuff, there is no way that physiologically based consciousness could have solved the problems that we solved in those archaeological experiments of where like locating Cleopatra's palace or the lighthouse of Pharos or uh, a buried building in a buried city and describing things that would be found there down to five sixteenths of an inch. There's no way that you could do that physiologically because there was not a single living person that knew that 
there, so where would that information be? And and just saying where is is incorrect because there's not it's not a question. Where is a spatial term? So the part of the problem is that it's difficult to think of. It's difficult to talk about. It's even difficult to think about. And I spend a lot of time doing this. What is going on? Because it's not aware. For instance, in 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 uh, ancient uh, Hindu traditions, Buddhist traditions, but Hindu particularly, the idea of the Akashic record. Now, it's depicted as being a place. And even in the Casey material, he talks about the Hall of Records. But it clearly is not a Hall of Records. It is some kind of... I, I have come to think of it after... I've been doing this now, whatever, from 1968 to to 2023, so however many years that is, it's over, in the, it's in the 50s, almost 60 years. A long um, time. <laughs> a long time, yes. <laughs> I, I've come to think of it as a kind of meta-Google. That is, it's it's some kind of an, infor- and I, the reason I use information architecture is that it is information that is arranged through intention consciousness in some way we don't understand. So what we do know about it is we know some things about how to access it. We know some things about is it easier to see some kinds of information than other kinds of information. For instance, we know in remote viewing that it's easier to see Chartres Cathedral than it is a French warehouse of the same physical size. Now, why is that? And the answer is because from the moment the French cathedral, uh, 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 Chartres Cathedral was conceived, it was the focus of intentioned awareness. And when people thought about it or worked on it, and then when after it was built, as they went there, they were in a heightened emotional state of focused awareness. Oh, I'm going to go into the cathedral and pray. Right? And those individual acts of intentioned awareness informationally enrich the information architecture, which is represented, of which the cathedral is a manifestation. I love this. This makes so much sense. Right? Whereas the warehouse, nobody pays any attention to warehouses. Yes. There is no focused attention on warehouses. So the the term that one ought to use is numinosity. Carl Jung, uh, the, the, the word itself was coined earlier in the 19th century, but Carl Jung in his writing, in his based on his research, said noumena, by which he means information, noumena are psychic entia. They are outside of space and time. So when something occurs which causes people to focus intention on something, it becomes numinous. It's easier to see. So Chartres is easier than the warehouse. That's one part of it. The second part of it is we know from the research that when there is entropic process, in a, in, in, in a sense, numinosity is a form of creating coherence. Entropy is a form of creating discoherence. And where there is discoherence, that is where, uh, for instance, if someone is murdered in a building, they cease to exist in their physical self. That creates informational discoherence, which is why we talk about ghosts and things like that. So we know that numinosity increases one's ability to access the data. We know that where there is entropic process, that also increases one's ability to access that kind of information. So we're dealing with an information phenomena, and we do know some things about how to manipulate it, but we don't actually know what it is we're manipulating, because that, again, is what is information, and we don't know the answer to that.
Now, I'd like to explore a bit more accessing information via remote viewing in the future, relevant to our current point in time, and have got a few questions around it. First of all, when we are talking about remote viewing, how many vectors does it have? Can we go both to, in current time, to another location? Can we go to the past? Can we go to the future? Can we even go to a parallel timeline or existence? Well, we know, again, from the experimental data, that it is as easy to describe something that's in the next room as it is something on another planet. So space is informationally enriching, but it is not a limitation. That's the first thing. We know that people can go back in time to locate something like Cleopatra's Palace or a sunken ship or the Lighthouse of Pharos or whatever, and they can do it without as easily as they can describe something that happened yesterday. The one thing we don't know, and I'm now doing a, an experiment to try to answer this question, is when people describe a future which has not yet occurred, are they describing, at the moment they describe it, the highest probability, or are they describing a fixed future? That is, when they describe this future, is it fixed? Or are they simply describing the highest probability at the moment that they are asked to answer the question? And I don't know the answer to that. We don't know that. I, I have some ideas about it, but I'm doing an experiment now. Between 1978 and 1993, I, uh, 91, I ask people to remote view the year, uh, the same day in the year 2050, same date. So I would say to them, uh, for instance, uh, I want you to go forward in time to uh, uh, the 6th of January, 2050. What do you see? Are you incarnated? And I could ask them all kinds of questions, and I did. And they were able to tell me all kinds of things which in fact have come to pass or are in the process of coming to pass. But I'm now doing a second round of experiments at 2060. And I'm trying to see what the difference is between the 2050s and the 2060s. Is there any difference? And I hope, I'm not sure what will happen, but I'm hoping that I will be able to answer this question of when you move into the future, are you looking at a fixed future or are you looking at the highest probability? But what we can say with authority is that space doesn't matter. The distance that you are being asked to describe, I mean, for instance, people from Australia have described for me uh, where shipwrecks are. Uh, one of Columbus's caravels was in, in St. Anne's Bay in Jamaica. So they did it just as well as people who were in Florida. So the difference between the, the people who were in Florida and the people who were in Australia, there was no difference. So distance didn't matter. Ingo Swan and Harold Sherman did a series of experiments where they described what space probes would find before they got there uh, about Mercury and Mars and Venus and Jupiter, and they turned out to be correct. That is, at the time that they provided the information, no one knew the information because it, wouldn't, it would only be revealed when the space probe got there some months later. So we know that distance doesn't matter. We know that time doesn't matter. They matter in the sense that they are informational enrichers, just like the question of numinosity or the question of entropic process, not just physical entropy, by the way, but also informational entropy. So space and time matter as enrichers, but not as limits. We know that. We don't know we know about the past because it has happened and therefore we can check it. We don't, as I said, we're not 
as clear about the future because um, that hasn't happened yet. And so we don't know. And it's a little more complicated. I need to say one other thing. For instance, I'm doing an experiment. I've been doing it for two years now where I get a group of people to describe for me what uh, there is a financial index in the United States called the Standard & Poor 500. So I ask people on Thursday, as I did yesterday, to describe for me whether the market will close higher than it opens or lower than it opens. That's one 24 hours in the future. I do it at 2 o'clock on Thursday, and um, the market closes. Uh, that's 5 o'clock Eastern time. I'm on the West Coast, and it, the market closes at 4 o'clock, 1 o'clock uh, my time. So I created a protocol. When I did the submarine experiment, DeepQuest, I created a protocol called Associated Remote Viewing because we discovered that it was very difficult to get analytical information uh, through remote viewing. Numbers, specific names, measurements, that kind of thing. Hard to do that. But you could create an association. So uh, that's the way I do this experiment. Um, uh, let's say uh, one target is a bridge and the other target is a lighthouse. And I have a random number generator pick the targets. And then I have a random number generator pick which target represents up. So if the market is going to go up and the random number generator assigns the bridge as that target, then I say to you, I'm going to show you a target tomorrow at 2 o'clock, uh, 2 o'clock Pacific. Can you please describe it for me? and they describe a target for me. Now, at the time they describe it, the target has not been selected. That is, I don't know what the target is. It's a triple-blind experiment. I like triple-blind experiments. So at the time that you're describing it for me, there is no target. The target is only selected after you have given me the information. And I don't, so I don't know what it is. And it's picked by a random number generator, so I don't even pick it. And then I have a random number generator tell me which target represents up and which target represents down. So if you describe for me the bridge, for instance, and the bridge has been selected for up, then I, 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 my prediction is the market will go up. That is, it will open, uh, it will close at a higher number than it opens. And if you describe the lighthouse, then it would mean that the market was closing at a lower number than it opened. Do you see? So that's it's the, the physical description. People are good at describing physical descriptions because that's the way their minds have been trained because of our sense impressions, because of our sensorial activity. So it's easy for people to describe a physical location, whereas it would be very hard for them if I said, does the market close up or down? Because that would require a kind of analysis, and that's not, that doesn't do well in remote viewing. I, actually, it doesn't do well in accessing non-local information. Remote viewing is just one of the ways to do that. Anyway, so I've been doing this experiment now for two years. And we have a 76% hit rate. That is, more than three out of four times, the description that people give me is correlated with exactly what the market says, does, that they're telling me it's going to do. And they tell me the day before. So they're acquiring this information. Now, relative to what I was saying earlier, does it make a difference if the thing you are describing in the future happens at the time you're describing it? Virtually, it's, it's locked in because the, the S&P 500 runs every day and it you know, it's, it's closes at a certain time and opens at a certain time. So it's all very fixed. Whereas if I ask you to describe what is medicine like in the year 2060, that isn't fixed. It's far enough into the future. And the reason, by the way, for 2050 and 2060 
is that if you get too far into the future, uh, you can't understand what they're saying. Uh, to give you an example, I learned this because Jules Verne, who wrote 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which was wildly successful in the 19th century as a novel, wrote a second novel about Paris in 1960. And in this manuscript, he says, first of all, horse-drawn vehicles are no longer present, that people drive around in internal combustion machines, and that business correspondence is sent using facsimile machines, that corporations control the economy, that women are part of corporations, and that the city of Paris is known throughout the world because of a large metal tower. Now, at the time that he wrote this, none of those things existed or were about to exist. And so he sent it to his editor and said, here's my next novel. And his editor wrote him back and said, Jules, as both your editor and your friend, the best thing I can tell you is just put this away and don't show it to anybody. It will make you sound like a fool because none of those things, there are no women in corporations and there are no corporations that are running the economy. Nobody's running around in internal combustion machines. And I have no idea what a facsimile machine is. And so Verne never published this novel. He put it in a safe and an heir of his uh, in the 1980s, early 90s, inherited a farm that he owned and he went to the farm and underneath one of the uh, uh, table in the barn was this safe. And he said to the farmer the, who managed the property, what's in the safe? And the guy said, I've no idea. I can't open it. My father couldn't open it. So he had a locksmith come up and open it and found this manuscript and the correspondence with the editor. And when I read about this in 91, I guess it was, I realized if you get too far out into the future, you just don't understand what they're saying. So if I said to you, for instance, and this were 1850, and you said to me, I, and I ask you to describe 2023, and you said to me, well, there's, I've got a thing that's about the size of a wallet that I can carry around with me, and it'll allow me to talk to anybody on the planet. What would you make of that? <laughs> or, yeah. right? Uh, so you, I didn't want to get too far out. So I went from in 78 to 91, I did uh, 2050. And then starting in 2018, I'm doing 2060. And what I'm looking for is the difference between 50 and 60. And then I may be able to answer that question. But even if we can't understand specific information or can't relate to it, I'm curious, is there a limit of how far we can go into the future with remote viewing, even if, if the information we can access makes no sense to us, but conceptually or as a, as a process, how far can we go? No, there's no limit. No limit. Okay. No, you, again... You're outside of space-time, so you mm. can go, you can do the meta-Google, as it were. A thousand years. And time isn't <laughs> the issue. You just won't understand what they're saying. And you have, no, so mm. I, I only like to do things where I can objectively yeah. verify the information. For instance, in the 2050 data, I started this experiment in 78. I left government in 76, and I had a little, a little daughter and I was very concerned that we were going to have a nuclear war. And I was part of the geopolitical community at that time. And most of the people in that world thought, because of the Cold War was at the height of the Cold War in the 70s, that we were going to have a nuclear war. And in fact, what almost nobody knows, except for one Soviet colonel who, who would not push the button when he was told to do so, we would have had a nuclear war. But he wouldn't push the button, and then they found out it was a mistake. But in any case, that's another story. But I was very concerned about this 
Okay. Have you accessed in your experiments, or do you know of someone who has accessed information from other planets or other dimensions that were able to be identified as such? Well, as I told you, uh, 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 Ingo Swan and Harold Sherman described other planets before the space probes got there, and it turned out their descriptions were correct. For instance, they said that Jupiter had a ring. And at the time that they said that, there wasn't a person on Earth who knew that, that whether that was true or not, but it turned out it was. So they described all kinds of things that, that later the space probe validated. So we again, we know that distance doesn't matter. The whole idea of dimensions is wrong fundamentally. Because again, that's a spatial term. You're, you know, it's a dimension. You're in space time when you talk about dimensions. So there are no dimensions in the non local. There are information architectures. Things are arranged in a way based on intention consciousness. It's, as I said to you in the beginning, it isn't clear to me or anybody else that I know of. It's clearly not just human intention, consciousness. We know now also that even within the earth that plants have consciousness, bees have consciousness, bees can recognize your face. Um, We know that animals have consciousness. We know that plants have consciousness. We know that, that fish have consciousness. So we live in a matrix of consciousness in which all consciousness is interdependent and interconnected. We know that death does not end consciousness. We know that consciousness existed prior to incarnation. We know that what comes across between lifetimes is information which manifests itself physically as scar tissue or um, birthmarks, that kind of thing. Uh, We have examples of this. So once you begin, this requires an entirely new way of thinking about things. You stop talking about dimensions. You stop talking about all of those things that require space-time terms. It's hard to do because we live in space-time. But what the research is telling us is that What we're really living in is a great information architecture and that consciousness, whatever that is, has the ability when it can focus properly to access anything in the the non-local domain. What freaked out a lot of people in the United States when the SRI guys began doing remote viewing that was about 10 years after I'd started and uh, five years later. They were government funded. I wouldn't do classified research, so I turned down funding because I did not want anything I did to be classified as there was. But what freaked people out who were funding them was that there were no secrets. And therefore, a congressman could be remote viewed and they could find out he was having an affair with his secretary or that... um, he was doing something illegal, and that really freaked him out. Plus, the evangelical Christians thought the whole thing was demonic. What we need to look at, I think, to really get into this, is you need to look at the relationship between non-local consciousness and religion and spiritual practices. Because if you look at religions, what you discover is that all religions begin because one individual has a non-local consciousness experience and he or she is sufficiently charismatic that when they talk about it, people listen. Jesus goes to John and he's baptized and he goes out into the desert and meditates and awakens. Mohammed goes to the sacred cave of Hira and he meditates and awakens because he sees Uh, He has a non-local consciousness experience. The Buddha goes to uh, an ashram and he's taught to meditate and he awakens. So 
they're all, it all starts with one person having a non-local consciousness experience or experiences. And they talk about it and people listen to that and they write it down and that becomes the scriptures. And then you create that. So religion emerges and whether it's a God or multiple gods and whether it's a male or a female, it isn't, of course, any of those things. But um, humans, when they have non-local consciousness experiences, as an, in an attempt to understand what it is they've experienced, try to put it in a framework that accords with what they understand about reality. So then you create, if, if, when there are enough people that it becomes a movement, and they pick a place that they want to gather, whether it's a temple or a synagogue or a church or an Etruscan oak grove, doesn't make any difference. You go to this place at a fixed time. And why does that matter? Because it becomes numinous because of the focused intention consciousness. And so that place, that's what we mean by sacred. That's what sacred means. Enough people have focused on that thing that it has taken on in the non-local domain a quality which they experience intellectually. So you go to this place that has been designated, whatever it is, and you gather together, and then you, you make a statement of shared intention. If you're a Christian, it's the Nicene Creed, for instance, and you focus on that, that begins to pro form a, a form of brain and training. Andrew Newberg, a neuroscientist who's created something called neurotheology, found that when people focused on something, that they uh, it caused that thing, whatever it, it was, to take on this quality and their brains all become entrained. That is, they all are synced up. And that that is augmented by dancing, drumming, chanting, singing together. And then there is a period of time during the service where an individual can, although not necessarily does, have a non-local consciousness experience that is witnessed by the others in the group, speaking in tongues, prophesying, healing, and that that, uh, that experience a demonstrates for them that what they are doing is authentically correct because they have this experience. And then you make a recommitment to gather at the next time. And so what the whole business is about is about opening to non-local consciousness. And what happens is it becomes acculturated for its time and culture. So it's a church, it's a synagogue, it's a temple, it's an oak grove, whatever, that these things form together and that people gather and they develop cultural affectations about it. But what you, when you get down to the core of it, it's that we are ultimately beings of consciousness and that the function of all religion and what we call spiritual is to become aware of this non-local aspect of consciousness and to access it. Absolutely. And I've got a question, in fact, from the spiritual perspective about the the notion of no secrets in remote viewing. There is a spiritual view, if you like, or a school of thought, which says that, first of all, no one can really access another person's Akashic field or information, i.e. the personal information, without their explicit permission. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, there is a view which says that we can actually protect access to our to information, our private or personal, I should say, information out there 
in the Akashic Records or in the Universal Mind, whatever you call it, from anyone else to be able to access it. Because if that's not the case, as you seem to suggest, it means that this is pretty much like a, allowing everyone and anyone to access my bank account information without me giving them specific permission and, and the key to it and password to it. So it's like free for all and anyone can access it. Well, I have a an ethical issue with that approach. I do believe, and maybe I want to believe, that it is up to me whether I allow or not allow someone else, anyone else, to access information that pertains to my incarnation or my soul, etc. What do you think of that? Not a word of that is true. Okay, how come? Well, because I have witnessed people accessing information that I am sure other people would not like them to know. It doesn't make any difference. That this is again, you you have to think about this differently. You can access anything. Now, could I get your bank account number? Actually, that would be extremely difficult to do because that's analytical. Or you could think of it as that is in space time, I guess. I don't I'm not quite sure how to describe that, but that's analytical. So it'd be very hard to get your bank account number. But if I wanted to know whether you were having an affair with someone, I could find that out. Okay. And do you think that from, once again, from the spiritual perspective, that this is, well, I will again use the word ethical, that is allowed in the spiritual world for all information to be accessible easily about everyone by everyone else? That's what they call black magic. So if you look at the course of human history, you see that the misuse of non-locally sourced information or the misuse of, for instance, the evil eye or putting curses on people, that was the negative aspect of healing. So the, the ethical issue ha ha makes a difference because utterly unethical people don't do this very well. So that's why you see lots of people who can do healing, but you don't see a lot of people who can do negative things. Because it's hard to, uh, the kind of person that is unethical is not a person usually, now I, I say usually, who can hold intention focused awareness. But there are some who could, who can. And so they are what we call in our culture, the black magicians. As far as I can see from all these decades of research, you can get information about anything. There is no limit about that. There are questions I wouldn't ask because I think they are unethical. So I, I would not do a remote viewing and ask somebody, uh, are you having an affair? Because I think that would be unethical, so I wouldn't do it. But if there was an unethical person who was able to attain and sustain intention focused awareness, could they do it? Yes, they could. But I wouldn't worry about that. That the nature of the kind of personality type that ha that is unethical doesn't usually have the ability to get that level of focus. But it does happen, and that's why we have in every culture of the world we have the idea of the black magician, or the dark magician, or the negative mu uh, magician whatever, because what we call magic is really about some manifestation of opening to non-local consciousness. Again, consciousness is causal and fundamental. Its manifestations are cultural. Okay. A somewhat different question, but in the same vein. What if there was someone who you, you would suspect are planning... Uh, some illegal activities or a terrorist attack or, or murder or something of, of that kind. Would you remote view that person? And if you did indeed find that that's what they are planning, would you then use this information to alert the authorities? It's just an ethical question. Well, I don't know that they would pay attention to you, but 
For instance, I have solved murders. I'll give you one okay. example. I was speaking at the Army War College, and after my talk, the, the man who was the major who was my minder, to, sort of taking me around, came up to me and said, the district attorney of the county and the chief of police are waiting to talk to you. And I think he thought I was going to get arrested. <laughs> and I said to him, well, I haven't been here long enough to break any laws, <laughs> so I don't think they want to arrest me. But he, it was, he was clearly <laughs> put off by it. Anyway, I, I went out to meet them, and I did meet them, and they said to me, we have a 14-year-old Amish girl who has disappeared, and we don't know what's happened to her, and Amish kids don't run away. So something has happened to her, but we don't know what. And can your remote viewers help us? And I said, well, I don't know. We'll give it a try. So I went back to the lab, flew back to L.A., where I was living at the time and working, and I got a bunch of remote viewers together, and they said, uh, this girl is dead. She was murdered by someone who was once a member of her community, but no longer a member of her community, that he was a teacher of some kind, that he enticed her to go with him because he was her teacher, and then he raped and murdered her. Uh, he didn't mean to, but, but she fought back and he, he struck her and killed her. And he took her body out into the woods and he buried it. And they described, I said, well, where in the woods? And I gave them a map and they, they marked it on the map. So I sent this to the uh, district attorney and he called me up and said, well, thank you very much, but uh, we don't know of any person that would fit that profile and we have searched those woods, and there's nothing there. And so, you know, don't call us, we'll call you, dismissing me. And so I thought, well, okay, it didn't work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So then about two or three weeks later, this is now the fall, I get a call from the district attorney. And he says, I want to apologize to you. A hunter was out hunting deer in the woods, and he found the body. And it was exactly where you located it and exactly in the condition and uh, covered up in exactly the way you described. And um, uh, the killer, yes. And so, and he said, oh, I, I left out something. The remote viewers at the, at the first time when I did the initial interviews, they said this guy killed this girl and he was panicked. He didn't know what to do. He put her body in the back of his car in the trunk and he drove around for an hour or so. And he got hungry and he stopped at a White Castle, uh, it's a hamburger chain in, in the United States. And he, he ordered and he had three hamburgers. So anyway, now we go back in the second call. And he calls me and he says, we found the body and described what I just said. And we think we've identified who the person is. Uh, we would never have thought about him, but, but uh, and there's nothing to suggest that he did it, but... It, uh, it accords with what the remote viewers said. So they brought the guy in to interview him, and of course he didn't, with his lawyer, and of course he denied everything. They had no evidence. But the district attorney said, okay, okay, I get it. I, you know you did it. I know you did it, whether I can prove it or not. But I just have one question for you. How could you kill a 14-year-old girl after you raped her, put her body in the back of your car, drive around for over an hour, and stop at a White Castle and order not one, not two, but three hamburgers. At which point the guy's lawyer said, uh, could I talk to my client alone for a moment? And he said to the guy, "If they did you do this? Did you go to a White Castle and did you order three hamburgers? Because if he's correct, not one, not two, but three hamburgers, if they know that detail, then they, they saw something and they've got a case against you. And this is the moment where you decide, I'm going to jail for years or I'm going to be sent to the death chamber. So you have a choice. And the guy confessed. And as you and I are talking, he's in jail. Okay. 
So it can be very useful in this regard for the right purpose. Beautiful. Now, Stefan, I've got um, a final question about time, which is one of my favorite topics. There are a few different schools of thought about the nature of time. Some say that time doesn't exist and is just an illusion. Others say that time is the fourth dimension. One thing that we all can agree on is that we do need linear time to function in this 3D physical reality and make sense of our experience. I'm curious, what is your take on what is time and its relationship to non-local consciousness? Well, this this is the realm of the will. Space-time exists and has a linear nature. I can demonstrate this experimentally, but I my interpretation of it, I note is my interpretation. I mean, I, that is, I can't prove it in the same way. It is my belief that this is the realm of the will and that space-time exists so that we have a linearity uh, that allows us to see the consequences of our actions. And that's what creates karma. The idea that we know that people come across from life to life with certain patterns sort of built in that run their lives in a way. You choose your race, you choose your socioeconomic you, you, a group, you choose your geographical location. All of that is you choose as you incarnate. And so you incarnate into physical reality, into space-time. It's kind of like a video game in a way, I suppose. Uh, in order to do things and make decisions and see the consequences of those decisions and awaken to the consequences of those decisions. So time, as I said, is an informational enricher in the non-local. At the local level, it is, uh, it is allows us to see the, the consequences of actions. That's why I say space-time is the realm of the will, and that what's really going on here is that for reasons we don't know, we, the eternal self of consciousness, manifests personalities episodically who are born into certain families, certain religions, certain races, certain socioeconomic groups with certain kinds of patterns so that you deal with those patterns by the choices you make. And because you are within time, you get to see, if you're enlightened enough, what the consequences of making those decisions about those patterns are. And you become enlightened, again, within the culture, what that, whatever that means in the culture, because if you do awaken to what the consequences are of that action, then if it fosters well-being, you continue, and if it doesn't foster well-being, you don't. And that's why a small group of individuals, if they hold a common consciousness, can change the course of history, because they see that a particular sequence of actions either fosters well-being or produces a lack of well-being or a degrading of well-being. I mean, if you, for instance, look at uh, Mahatma Gandhi, just before he was assassinated in 1948, a reporter from the Times of India came up to the ashram where Gandhi was, and he said to him, Gandhi, my editor wants to know just one question. How were you able to force the British to leave India and give it independence? You have no army, you have no money, you had no official position. How was that possible? Gandhi's answer was, it wasn't what we did that mattered, although that did matter. It wasn't what we said that mattered, although it did matter. It was the nature of our character, our beingness, I would say, that caused the British to choose to leave India. And we know, and I wrote a book about this called The Eight Laws of Change, 
We know that when 10% of any cohort, whether it's a church group, a school group, a neighborhood committee, or a nation, and we know this from experimental data, when 10% of the group hold intentioned consciousness about something, that the whole cohort, however large it is, have to change their consciousness to accommodate for it. And so in the realm of the will, the issue for me and the thing that I care about, this is my philosophy, if you will, is it is up to each of us to foster well-being at every level because we live in a matrix of consciousness and when we harm the, the well-being of the matrix, we harm not only whatever it is, the plants, the animals, the fish, but we also harm ourselves because we break down the well-being of the matrix. And what's going on right now in human history is we have created climate change. We are in an existential crisis. And the choice is, are we going to continue doing what we're doing? Or are we going to change and begin to foster well-being? And let me leave you with this in our final thing. Every individual, every day, makes lots of little choices. The toilet paper you buy, the toothpaste you buy, the cat food you buy, the gas you buy, whatever. Every one of those choices is a vote either to support well-being or to degrade it. And if each person who listens to this podcast will make the commitment that their choices every day will all, in every instance, they will choose, to, to of the choices available to them, they will choose the one that they think fosters well-being, and they will tell 10 people that they're doing it as a discipline and invite them to join you, that if the people who listen to this podcast will do this, always making the choice that fosters well-being, they will change the course of history. Beautiful. What a beautiful and important message. Thank you so much, Stefan. How people can uh, connect with you, access your work, and I will, by the way, include all the links in the show notes, but just briefly, how people can connect with you. You can go to my personal website, stephanaschwartz.com. You can, I publish a daily web publication focused on well-being, schwartzreport.net. Uh, you can go to academia.edu or um, PubMed, the National Medical Archive, or Science Direct. You can get my hundreds of papers. You can go to Amazon or some other seller and get my books, particularly based on what I just said, The Eight Laws of Change, about remote viewing, opening to the infinite, which is everything science knows about remote viewing. Or you can go to YouTube and there are, I don't, I don't even know how many interviews there are now, but lots. So I make it all, and I make it all freely available. I don't charge for any of it. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yes, there is a wealth of, of material, your work in, and information for people to access. And once again, I will include all the links in the show notes. Well, Stefan, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to to have this enlightening conversation with you so enriching and 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 mind opening and such a pleasure to have you on quantum living thank you so much uh, my pleasure to do it you ask very good questions thank you <laughs> thank you so much all the best all right well you take care all the best you have a good new year thank you so much that's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.